every time either myself or Dr. Scott has studied Ephesians and presented it, it has been kind of this chapter, seen chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But when you step back, you see these themes that become very important for understanding what the King James sums up as, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. So if the theme throughout is in Christ, and then add to this, um, I'm going to combine all of these subjects. So in, in the heavenlies, um, truth, spirit or spirituality or spiritual, love, then the lesser subjects, flesh, grace, and glory. But the one reoccurring theme that really just leaped out at me was the word walk. Beginning at the fourth chapter, and it's, you've also, it's, it's in the second chapter one time, but in, beginning in the fourth chapter, it begins to set up concepts for you to walk in unity, to walk in Christ, to walk in love, to walk as the children of light, to walk in the spirit of wisdom. So when that is clear and you've got those major themes, you notice something interesting. Words like flesh, grace, and glory, which appear less. Um, and even the word, for example, I studied the word body within Ephesians. Each one of these nine occurrences of the word body have to do with his body, not mine. Only one time does it have to do with husband and wife reference. All the others have to do with his body, so it comes back to being in Christ. So you can see this great theme of the book. Now, why should that matter here as we come to the core of this? Because if you remember last week, I looked at those Greek words um, for being strong, being continually empowered. Do you remember that from last week? Amen. All right. So remember that in 610, when it says, be strong in the Lord, endunamuste. Remember I said that's the only place where you have a passive verb in the Greek. It means that essentially, on, on an ongoing basis, I receive my strength from him. Now, I should have elaborated on this, but I felt like I was going to run out of time, so I just kind of rushed on without giving you some scriptures to give you an idea of how this word, how it's a, it's a d dynamite word, it's a power word, but how, just how powerful this word in 610 is. I will give you the scriptures. Actually, I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you them afterwards because you're going to start turning. Even when I tell you not to, you turn the pages. <laughs> and I said, you cannot outspin me. So this one you know. Um, from the scriptures, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That is that same endunamus word. Then, and that's from Philippians 4.13. Then elsewhere, in 2 Timothy 4.17, Paul says, The Lord stood by me and strengthened me. That's that same endunamus word. So I want you to think of this concept as here, this first word that opens the gateway is the strength, the dynamite, the power we receive from him. And I said, how do we receive that? We remain in Christ. Remember, I just covered the major themes. The major theme of this book is in Christ. So if you're in Christ, you will be in dynamited. Just, these are, you can't move anywhere in this book that you don't confront the same concepts. He's not going into different territory now except to explain something about a very crucial element of our walk. Now, remember, I mentioned the word, one of those words that's reoccurring, to walk, walk in unity, walk in love. Um, so it tells you that in the activity of moving on in this Christian journey, you will also have to walk and then stand firm. You can't just continually be moving. At some point, you must stand, which is from uh, our sixth chapter. Um, and beginning at the 10th verse forward, you're going to hear him say, stand, stand, stand. So the whole book has been walk, walk, walk. Here he says, stand. Don't think that that is essentially the license to just stand still and do nothing. What he's saying is, 
feet are planted ready for battle. I'm standing firm in what I have received, which brings me back to being in Christ. Now, when we get to uh, verse 12, we have a very good idea of what we are up against. So the, the outline of this, we would say we are dealing with what, what, and how. Now we will get a detail of who we are dealing with in this journey. So what I've done is I have put the whole text out there on my tablet. I don't want you to go, oh, wow, do I have to read Greek? No. Just, I just want you to see something. So this is verse 12. Your King James says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's verse 12. I just want you to see one thing. I want you to see all of these Greek words, pro, pro. I deliberately lined this up so you could see all of these words, which the Greek is not afraid to repeat words, unlike the English, if you repeat something too often, uh, King James translators were really on top of that, they would change words, and there you go. So I want you to take a look at this, and instead of doing a whole bunch of grammar that only some of you can decipher, I'm only gonna show you in this what you really need to know, and what would be really important here. Let's start off with, um, this is, Ephesians 6.12 in the Greek, and as I said, you don't have to read Greek. You don't have to be a Greek student. I'll spell things out that are important. But this one word that begins the verse, hoti, which in your King James simply says for, hoti, is a conjunction giving us further reason to put on the whole armor of God. So this little uh, word right here, it's a conjunction, it helps us to know really what we're heading into. And then, let's use another color. I'm going to use green. Here's the only verb in this whole sentence in the Greek. And it is, we're going to just simply put is. That's all. So it's a simple thing, is or there is. So let's do a little translation first. Let's do this. Hoti, because, is that, really, is that green really fierce on your eyes? A little bit, isn't it? Let's try another flashy color here. <laughs> because, wow. <laughs> because not, uk, not, is. We're going word for word here. To us, to us, umin. And here's an interesting word here. So let's spell this out for all who do not. We'll, put, we'll spell it poly. So when we talk about this, because our wrestling is not. Polly, which um, Dr. Scott rightly translated as a one-on-one, hand-to-hand combat or wrestling, but you're, you are in direct contact one-on-one. -on -one. This is not a group effort here. This word is very suggestive, and I would simply say, if you're going to ask me why do I say this, there is another Greek word that Paul could have used. Remember, this is a man who's a wordsmith. He could have picked anything. There's another word, polemio, from which we get our English word polemics. Um, he could have used that word, but instead he used this word, which many of you have heard me use the term hapex lagomen, which means it only occurs here. And you really have to kind of figure something out, that there is essentially... People would say, well, he starts off by using this wrestling imagery and then gives us the whole armor of God, which basically brings a connotation of an army, and we go away from wrestling. No, what he's trying to do with this one word, poly, is to make sure that we understand that this is a one-on-one. -on -one. This isn't, I'm going to take on a whole group or we're going to do it together. This particular wrestling is a one-on-one -on -one contact, and it may be at close proximity, 
and it may be at a distance, but this is why he uses this word. So um, let's write down here, uh, I used a definite article, the wrestling, even though this is a noun. So what we have is because our wrestling is not, and here we go. So the first pro, against, and these, all of these, what are, what's being translated against, pro, are all in the accusative, which again reaffirms the fact that this is a believer one-on-one -on -one against these forces. So against, you notice what happens here, and it's not going to make or break anything, but the Greek has blood first, against blood, and aima kai sarka, and flesh. A little reverse of what happens in your King James where we have, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against blood and flesh as the Greek reads. But here we have Allah, but Allah right here is a hyper-coordinating conjunction which tells you that what's about to happen takes a little bit, takes this up a little notch. It's a little bit more important. So not all conjunctions in the Greek are created alike. This one is hyper coordinating. So, a la pro. So here we go. We wrestle not against, going from the King James, against, what is the first one here? Against principalities. Against protas arcas. And I want you to see, we can know absolutely from the Greek that we're dealing with a plural. In fact, each one of these is plural. And ladies, you're going to hate me, but all of the uh, arcas and exousias are feminine. Uh, <laughs> I didn't make that up, but don't feel too bad because the cosmocrados are of the male gender. <laughs> Equal rights here, no discrimination. All right, so first we have against protas arcas. This is important to understand. I'm going I'm, I'm to talk about these words in a radically different way than I've ever done to put something on display, to make something clear. So your King James says principalities, and then against powers, against pro tas exousius, against powers, and against, what does it say here? Against the rulers of the darkness. So this is kind of a word that's missing in action slightly. Cosmocratros, um, toskotus tutu, which is being translated of this darkness, of this darkness, and here's another one of these pro, against, and this is a difficult one because this ta pneumatica, this is being translated spiritual, spiritual wickedness. We have a plural here, but it's not exactly like the rest of the plurals. I want you to see, the reason why I'm mentioning plural, many times we read and even though we read plural in the English, we do not see the plurality of these beings. Now, if you missed the message two weeks earlier, I was talking about the rankings of the angels, the good angels, the ones that are not fallen. Well, there are also rankings among the fallen angels, of which, of course, Satan, and we call him the chief among them, but he's got a whole hierarchy underneath him. He calls the shots and he sends out and dispatches. So we're looking at um, kind of the levels of the hierarchy in terms of spiritual evil. And there's a good reason why we should look at this. I was talking to somebody last week who said they had not so much as even heard of this thing called uh, spiritual warfare. So it's important that we talk about this because when things happen in our life, we need to know how to deal with things. There are natural things that will occur, and then there are, we'll use the term for right now, supernatural, the things that are against us. Now, not everything is of the devil. As I said, that bad coffee you had this morning, that wasn't of the devil. <laughs> that was just old stuff that was sitting on the burner for a long time, and when you tasted it, you said, wow, that tastes like hell. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Don't attribute everything to the devil, all right? So let's get back to this. This is a little bit heavy for a little while, but then I'm, I'm going to make some, I think, some strides to make this much clearer. So if you're those, one of those people that says, I don't read Greek and I don't understand, hang in there. It's going to be real clear for everyone. So here in the King James, it says, 
against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have here against, let's translate this if you can read that, against the spiritual, spiritual, this phonerias, the spiritual forces of evil, of evil, in tois epurenus, in the heavenlies. Now, not to be confused, I'm going to say this from the start. If you're reading Ephesians and Colossians and some of the other letters that Paul writes, heavenlies can have a large territory. There are the heavenlies, which are where Christ is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And then there is a lower heaven where the angels, unfallen, have their estate, which Jude says some of these fell and left their first estate and were cast down to earth, which now, from other parts of Scripture, we know as the prince of the power of the air, and that is the air about us and around us, clear up into the heavenlies, not reaching necessarily the same heavenlies as the angels unfallen, but still in the realm of the heavenlies above us. That can be a little bit confusing. Now, why am I doing all this? I'm going to start first a slightly out of order. I'm going to start first with dealing with exousias, which in your King James, you are reading against powers, correct? Against principalities and powers. So I want to start first in dealing with this word exousia. And you'll understand, I think, why I'm doing this the way I'm doing it. Let's pick, go back to this color here. Um, okay, that was last week. All right. Wow, what does that look like? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is a test of what you see. All right. Okay. We know that the devil is an imitator. He tried to ascend to be like God. He's always imitating. He's always pseudo-something. So I took the word exousia first. Your King James is being translated as powers. Let's put that here, powers. And on the other side here, I'm going to put exousia. You have to bear with me as I put this all out to make sense of something so we can see just how limited, even though it is a great exousia, great powers that the devil has, they're still limited powers. And I'm going to show you why in this crazy circle. They actually, I'm sure, put people away for doing this. Uh, all right, so let's do this. If I was trying to show you the progress of a concept, we would do this. At the very top, in the beginning, just like Genesis, right? In the beginning. And I'm going to put a line through this, right, where these circles overlap. Now, in the beginning, God said, in Genesis 1, 26 through 128, he says regarding Adam, he says, let them, let them have dominion. I pray I don't run out of space. <laughs> let them have dominion over all the earth, right? Okay. Now, I've got to go back here. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. We're going to find many Hebrew words being translated into the Greek, and one of these, one of these translations will have the word for dominion being translated exousia. Okay? Sometimes rule and sometimes government. So, God in the beginning gives to Adam and Eve the exousia, everything, over everything. And I use the words here, dominion, rule, and government. And the government word is quite interesting as well because you'll find that word for government referring to Christ in Isaiah 9, 6 when it says the government upon his shoulders. So you get an idea that this term for exousia carries a lot of weight. Now hold that thought. Let's use red. And right here at this line that I've drawn at the bottom of the circle, we're going to put here Genesis 3, 
they, in the fall, lost that dominion. That was lost. And if you read carefully at the end of Genesis 3.22, Genesis 3.22 and 3.23, they are prohibited access to the tree of life lest they eat and live forever. You remember that? Okay, so access to the tree of life is denied. Clear, right? Okay, right in this small bottom part right here, I'll put a dot and I'll extend it. We have the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 of Christ, the promise and prophecy of Christ. And so now I'm jumping ahead and racing through the Bible to get to this bigger circle. This bigger circle, of course, represents Jesus Christ. Jesus says, all exousia is given unto me, where? In heaven and in earth. That is Matthew 28, 18 forward. All exousia. So you really see right here that what was lost in the garden, all dominion, every kind of dominion, is now given to Christ, who says, all exousia has been given unto me, and then he gives the great commission, go ye therefore. It's clear, right? I've got to add to other scriptures to get the full picture before I descend and give you the other spheres you'll get to in a minute. We'll put here, this is, this is Satan's sphere, and this is the world, world sphere, and this is us. Wow. Okay, now we're just a bunch of balls. Okay. So let's do a little something. I'm going to put some scriptures down here. You can check me out later. But in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, it says he taught the people as having exousia, authority, not as the scribes. Then in Mark 2 and verse 10, is the healing of the man who, they say, are you going to heal this man? Well, what's easier, to heal the man or to say your sins are forgiven? But you may know that the Son of Man hath exousia. Pick up your bed and walk, right? So the proof that, the proof, if you want, Jesus could have said, all exousia is given unto me, but the proof is this man gets up and he walks. So that means he is healed and he's forgiven. That means Son of Man has exousia on earth. All right, Matthew 10 talks about how he gave the 12 exousia over unclean spirits. Now, I want you to think about that. These were only men, but they had exousia. Let's go back to dominion, rule, government, and your King James reads power, which is not wrong, but I want to, these are degrees of power, control. We might also use the word, perhaps, uh, I maybe did it here, we might use the word, um, in many cases, authority. And some translations do that. Jesus, regarding himself in John 10, says, No man taketh my life but I lay it down. I have the exousia to lay it down and the exousia to take it again. So you're getting the point of what I'm driving at. Christ has all exousia in heaven and in earth. And then in John 17, he says something quite profound. He says he's got exousia over all flesh. So if that's abundantly clear, let's talk about what connects us the circle is Christ with all exousia. Let's talk about what connects us to Christ. You see, you read English and you read certain words that don't... The King James will use the word power, but power may be translated by six or seven different words in the Greek. So this word is quite important, so bear with me. Here for us, what does it say? In John 1.12, but as many as received him... To them, he, he gave the exousia to become the sons of God. As many as received 
him, Christ. He gave exousia. So you can see our connection. Now I'm going to draw some lines because in my drawing you can see the middle circle and the bottom circle. There was much more space. I'm going to draw some lines. So you've heard the scripture before, hath not the, the potter. What's the word? Exousia over the clay. Oh, wow, I'm connecting some good dots here. Exousia over the clay. If you're interested, that's out of Romans 9, and I believe verse 21. That's one. The second thing, second line, remember this all flows from Christ. He is God, exousia over the clay. That's you and that's me, right? Yeah. That's not somebody else's material. That's your junk, right? Okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd be clear, and some of you are going, okay. The next thing that Christ says is, I will give exousia over the nations. That's from Revelation 2 and verse 26. And then lastly, I'm mean, running out of space here. Revelation 20 says, the second death hath no exousia over you. Okay, yeah, I agree with you right there. So, if you, if you get why I'm so excited, then let's talk about the exousia out of Ephesians, and let's talk about the other exousia that are not part of uh, what Bush called the axis of evil. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the world first. There are regular worldly, earthly powers the centurion, he says, I'm a man under exousia. We've got words like, out of Luke 23, 7, Herod's jurisdiction, Herod's exousia. And Pilate says to Christ in John 19, I have exousia to release you. I also have exousia to crucify you. So you understand that this word exousia can also be used in a worldly fleshly but not necessarily evil manner. And then you turn to the box that says Satan. We have, you know, we, we read the King James, prince of the power of the air, right? Prince of the power is really prince of the exousia of the air. Now, some of you who have listened to me know that there are, as I said, other words for power. The dunamis words can be used for power sometimes. There's different words, kratai. Um, just, there's plenty of them, but he uses this word, prince of the exousia, the what? Dominion, rule, government, authority of the air. Same word that will occur in Ephesians 6.12, which we are looking at. And then if you want to add color to this, we have out of... The book of Revelation 13 forward regarding the beast where it says it was given to him to make war with the saints and in there you'll find regarding the beast he had exousia as well. So there are diversities of beings who have been given exousia. Some use the exousia God word, those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ may use them in the worldly fleshly sense or if it's according to the devil according to the air or the darkness. Now, if you want to see this word exousia in action, I'm just going to read to you. I don't want you turning there because it's not my goal to go to another passage. I want us to stay on target. I am determined to make this point today. If I fail at everything else, it's all good. This one thing matters to me. All right, this word exousia, I'll tell you where it appears. Well, I won't really tell you, but I'll kind of give you a hint in a minute. After the third time where the Apostle Paul is giving his apologia, his testimony, in front of King Agrippa, and he's talking about how the Lord spoke to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now listen carefully because these three verses contain um, an idea of what this word really carries with it. Jesus speaking, 
But Paul is recounting, says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the exousia, the power, the exousia of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So you get the idea that this concept of being able, as Christ said, to get them out of the power and turn them towards Christ and therefore becoming sons of God. So you can see how important the terminology and the use and understanding of this word is. But wait, there's more. All right. This is what's so exciting. You remember I started here with the tree, right? We started here. They, because they lost dominion, they also lost access to the tree in the garden. So when you come down here to us, you read, they may have exousia to what? To the tree of life. That is Revelation 22 and 14. So you can see what damage was done at the beginning through Christ because Christ is all exousia is given to him. We become the sons of God through that exousia. We will have access to the tree. We are turned from the exousia of Satan Godward to be able to by way of staying in him have access to him. And so you, you kind of see this word is super important. Well, how does this play out in our text? Remember, we wrestle not. Our one-on-one -on -one conflict, our struggle one-on-one -on -one is not against blood and flesh. It's not against human individuals. But rather, and I jumped over the principalities to get to the powers because it gives you a clear demonstration of how Satan is always trying to imitate to pseudo, to have access to you in a pseudo way. So think about this. He is called the prince of the exousia of the air, even though he was cursed to the ground, prince of the exousia of the air. Now, people have come up with some really strange ideas about spiritual warfare. But what does Jesus say about evil? He says evil starts inside. Evil does not come necessarily from without. I've had people argue this with me about, um, well, the, the eye is the window to the soul, or is the, you know, they, they have all these nice things that they'll say. And although those could be truisms, the reality is that a blind person sins as much as a sighted person, or someone who is mute, or someone, do you understand my, my point? Evil comes from within side. Evil is not necessarily seen. We are maybe stronger, uh, led away in our influences by the things we see or by the things we hear. But we have the capacity, based on what I've read from Scripture and what I know, and this passage alone, to be able to stand against these methods. Why? Because we understand how the devil works. Now, if he's the prince of the power of the air, I remember Dr. Scott once teaching about people breathing in demons. Well, it, it's not exactly a, like people say, <gasps> like that. It's not exactly like that. But the idea is, think of it this way. We are made creatures of God, first by his prevenient grace, and then secondarily by becoming a habitation of God. And when you begin to think about that, the habitation of God could very easily, and I say this carefully, when people don't pay attention to this warfare, be led away. You remember I started down a path in one of my messages saying false teaching, false doctrine, because we say, well, we're the habitation of God. And then we, we depart from the word, we depart from the life of faith. We live like someone who's received a brand, a superficial stamping, but nothing has been imprinted upon the soul until you abide in the word. 
boy, Pastor Scott's got a one-track mind. But now I want you to see what's going on here. So when we get into wrestling with these forces, as Paul is discussing, this exousia is powerful, but not all-powerful. And that's what we need to understand. When people talk about the devil and his minions, or the way the devil might attack, he has power. You see the word exousia is used of him, prince of the exousia, the power of the air. Now, help me out here a little bit with a thought process. Why do you think peppered in here, inside this book of Ephesians, we've got the word in Christ, in God, in Christ, our walk. And then we have these really amazing words like truth. It's because peppered along the way, Paul is writing something that, of course, Ephesians 6 is not just this capstone. It's kind of like saying now, this is the elaboration, if you will, on what I was saying throughout this whole book. Small but powerful. It begins with us being chosen out of some ex alexito who were not chosen for God to himself and ends with us in a one-on-one -on -one contest with the devil. Now, don't say, wow, that's depressing. No, that should be encouraging to you. Oh, you have a strange way of thinking, Pastor Scott. Well, let me say it this way. Many people will say, the mark of a believer is, and they'll go on to catalog that a believer doesn't do this, and a believer doesn't say that, and a believer doesn't breathe, and a believer doesn't do any of those things. But the reality is, there's one thing you can know. Just as the hound of heaven was pursuing you, we'll call it hot on your heels. So once a person is born again from above, this prison that you were freed from and I was freed from now sends envoys, but they're not sent and dispatched to all. They're dispatched to the ones who have the ability to recognize that they were damned drowning and dying otherwise. They, they, there wasn't anything else. To those who have the ability, and this is very simplistic, but very profound, because th this is where it separates. It does sift the people. To you understand, there are people who will be indifferent about their faith. They come into the church, and they're indifferent about it. Well, Satan's not going to bother you, friend. Somebody said, who goes to another very large ministry, said, well, you, this is probably two, three years ago, Pastor Scott, you talk way too much about the devil. Well, the reality is in that church, they don't talk about him at all. And there's a reason why. Because if this is not your book, and you're not walking around as a dual person, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the devil's not attacking Melissa Scott because I'm Melissa Scott. The devil attacks me because Christ lives in me. I am alive but crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, here it goes. There is the conflict. There is the struggle. The devil desires to pluck you away from your connectivity. What's the whole book talk about? In Christ. When you settle that, all exousia is given unto me in heaven and earth, Christ speaking, you realize he had the exousia to call you to himself to make you a son or a daughter of God. But that doesn't mean you're going to walk in and nothing's going to bother you. Why, well, I said if Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, and we know he was, Luke records it very clearly. What makes you think, or what makes me think, that I'll be immune? Now, let's go to the second part. I only dealt with one word. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> I, it's, you know, it's, it's not easy here. Let's, let's see. We get a new page. All right. Remember, I started with the second word, powers. But let's talk about principalities, which um, if you're a Strong's person, 746. But the Greek is archos. Now, from this word, archos, we get arche. We get... And these are necessary that you see all of these. I'll explain them in a minute. We get RK. We get, if you were with me, um, when I taught out of Hebrews, Archigos, which is what is being translated in Hebrews as captain 
of our salvation, arche, the beginning. So there's all these different um, words that are connected. They are cognates. Why am I telling you this? John 1, 1. In the, let's write it in English, in the arche, all right? In, in the beginning, in the arche, was, well, let's go off the side here. Was the word? I can't write like that. I have no place to move around. All right, so if you are reading Genesis, in the Septuagint, Genesis 1.1 uses the same word, in arche. Now, we have some clear pictures. I'm trying to paint these on into your mind so that when you leave here, you recognize the very same forces you are coming against with the devil. The greatest one of all sits at the top, Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, I'm, uh, how can I even defend myself? Well, that's why we need to look at the, the pieces, the whole panoply. But in the meantime, if you don't understand what you're dealing with, which is always the pseudo person. Remember, Satan wanted to ascend to be like God. I will, I will ascend to the throne. I will be. So I want you to see the picture. Again, the three circles, except here we have this first circle will represent Christ. This second circle here will represent the world, the world and the flesh. Here we have evil forces. And last but not least, here is us. All right. Okay. So let's take, we're talking about the word from our scripture here, principalities, but I'm using the Greek word to show you how all these terms are connected. Now, in Ephesians, let's go back to this black. In Ephesians, Ephesians 1.21 talks about Christ who is far above all archos and exousius. Why? Because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. When, he, when, when Paul says far above, he's talking about at the highest point, wherever that is in the heavens, there is Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And all of these things essentially are under his feet, if you want to use imagery like that. Um, we're still building on this concept. You can also find the same concept in Ephesians 3.10 regarding what is under Christ. When you come to the end of the book, Revelation 1.8, in Revelation 21.6, uh, and in 22.13, Jesus says, I am the uh, Alpha and Omega your King James reads the beginning and the ending. Well, he is the arche. Oh, boy. All right. He is the, right English. He is the arche. That is who he says he is. The beginning and the ending goes straight through. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the arche, and the ending. Now, I'm going to jump away from this for a minute so you can see. We'll jump to the evil forces first. You'll find the word arche. I'm using English letters now. First in Jude 6, where it says, the angels which kept not their arche estate. Now, that's not going to help us too much, but it will help you to understand that in 1 John 3, 8, I'm writing all these down so you can too. It says, the devil sinneth from the arche, sin from the beginning, speaking of the devil. Um, Colossians 2.15 talks about how Christ spoiled these forces. That doesn't mean spoiled in our modern sense. It means ruined, not completely defeated in terms of removing power, but spoiled in that the handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the, the tree, and in his resurrection, he spoiled these powers. They're not yet removed from the earth. You've got to go to the book of Revelation to read that end time period where Satan is bound for a thousand years and then ultimately cast into the lake of fire. But until that time, I've heard people say, well, Satan doesn't have any access to the earth because he's in hell. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Um, okay, 
That means all scripture is wrong, by the way. Um, Jesus calls Satan. He calls him the Arche, Prince of this world. Now, all you've got to do is amass some of these scriptures to recognize these evil forces the, in our plural. Remember, I started by telling you these are plural. Exousius, plural. Archos, plural. That means a myriad, a multitude, not just one dispatched, but legions. We don't know the, the number per se. We can't say broken down, but we can say a great vast host of spiritual evil. Let's go to the world for a minute here, and you'll find that the same thing. There are archos in the world. They are governors, Luke 20, 20. They are um, rulers of the synagogue, no pun intended. That'll hit you later, <laughs> Luke 8, 41. And, of course, even a person like Nicodemus in John 3, 1, he was called a ruler, a ruler of the Jews, an an arche of the Jews. So we also have this word in compounds. We have the arch high priest. We have the archangel. We've got this word in compounds all over the place. Head, beginning, um, leader. And of course, when it speaks of Christ, we have the term archegos being used as prince, he is prince and savior. He is, um, he is our high priest. So I want you to see how not just pseudo and copycat, but we're talking about the first of the evil kind and of its kind. So we could use words to describe this evil. And I'm trying to paint the picture well, what, what about us? What, what type of thing do we have? Well, go, go all the way down to our small little circle. I just taught on this verse not too long ago. Hebrews 3.14 says, We are made, for we are made, I'll write it out, for we are made partakers, partakers of Christ if we hold fast. I love this. Our if we hold a circle fast, if we hold the arche <laughs> of our confidence. So that's how we stay. Again, it comes back to being in Christ. So you begin to understand you cannot fight these forces, these evil forces. You cannot fight against them unless you stay connected. And these words paint a very clear picture. Now let me jump to the last one. I know I'm going to run late. Hold your bladders, folks. I'm rushing as fast as I can. Let's go to the last one. The last word is the word being used or being translated. Let's go back to my tablet for a second. Cosmocratos. Remember, I said that's plural. So plural, plural. Are you seeing these words in here now a little bit clearer? To understand it's like peeling back an onion. There are levels under levels under levels, but plural and with force, except for one thing. They have limited force, not full force as Christ, the arche of our faith, Hebrews 12. Not as Christ, I have exousia over all of heaven and earth. But this is, this, the last one here is kind of interesting. If you break it down, cosmo. Kratos, you've got the word cosmo from where we get our word for cosmos, and krataras, which is power. So we have cosmic power, world power, and this is the only time this word appears in the entire Bible. So I thought, well, why not show you the, I've been showing you the pseudo, right? Cosmocratos is the pseudo of the original, of the originator of the one. Why not show you um, the original? I'll write it out in English for you. Pantocrator is used of God, used of Christ. And 
you see the creator there. So, and in the, in the English, let me write out, um, we'll write it like this, Cosmo Crateros. Only one time used of the devil, but Pantocrator is used in such an incredibly profound way that, yeah, the devil could only get one of these in, even though it's plural, he could only get one in, because when I tell you what Pantocrator means for us, you understand we have to fight Polly one-on-one, -on -one, but we have such a great force with us. So hold your brains for just 30 seconds more. You'll find this word Pantocrator in scriptures such as 2 Corinthians 6.18, which is actually a quote. Paul is quoting Jeremiah 31, and I may have Septuagint. I may have misquoted that. Don't quote me on that. But Jeremiah 31, I believe it's verses 1 and 9. But you will find it used in the New Testament, specifically in these verses, which you won't see in English. You'll only see it in the Greek. Revelation 1.8. And let me give you an idea so I can... I can kind of put some weight behind this. In Revelation 1 8, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the Arche, and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, I love this, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. Here is your word. Pantocrator, the Almighty. So this, this word carries such a heavy power to it because almost universally as it is used in Revelation, it is representing the God of old, the God that is, and forgive me for saying the God of old, but what John is referring to is past, present, and future. Now if you were to take this word and try and find some Hebrew equivalents, as I look to my Hebrew New Testament, what I found this word translating was Shaddai and, what's this will be fun, Zeboeth and Elohi. So in Shaddai, we have the breasted one, the sufficiency of God, Zeboeth, Lord of hosts, Lord of animate and inanimate objects, and Elohi. God of creation speaking into being, all encompassed into this word being translated in your King James, the almighty Pantocrator. So when you think about it, you've got one reference to this plural force of cosmocratorus, ruler with power of the cosmos. But you have many references to Pantocrator, not only the agent of creation, the agent that gives life, the agent to overcome sufficiently to call into, as an army, a host to fight for and with his people that he has chosen. When you begin to put this in perspective, it's still scary stuff, but it's not as scary because you recognize the fighting forces of God are greater than the fighting forces of the devil. Now, I had to cover this like this to get you to see if you break this down, you see the archos, the principalities, and the exousias, the powers, and the cosmocratos, scary stuff, layers upon layers upon layers in, in the ranking of this evil hierarchy. But soul militancy that says, the Lord has provided something for me here, that even these rulers of spiritual darkness, these evil ones, cannot win over me if I remain in Christ. Now, the rest of the passage, to take on the whole armor of God, to put it on and to stand, begins to unfold the clarity of why you need first the belt of truth. As I said, not subjective in, well, let me, let me say I cannot tell a lie and I'm a basically honest person. No, that's a lie because our thoughts are evil, but rather the truth as it is in Christ. And as I receive that truth, conviction comes, which brings repentance, which brings me back to a connection with God. And as I remain in Christ, I am able to take that stand, feet planted, 
and withstand in the evil day the methods of the devil. And they are many and many subtle and many deceitful and many ways that he does his work. But this passage, if understood, tells me there is a greater force. These words, forgive the, the labor of pulling them out, but at least you're going to leave here knowing there is a dominion that is of God, that belongs to him. Yes, there's a dominion. There is a rule and a government of Satan as well. But my Bible tells me here that as I remain in Christ, I will stand firm and have the victory, the spiritual victory over these evil forces. Now, that's not only just a, a word from the word, like, oh, that's a good thing, but it means as you go into the next week, go into the next week with this on your mind, Putting on the whole armor of God is not an exercise of these things. It's an exercise of, sorry, you're going to hate me for repeating this, John 15, abiding and staying connected in the word. And as you stay connected in Christ, you will have the power to stand when the, when the attacks come, to stand and withstand and to even quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Thank God that Paul expounded on these things who were not left without any defense. We're left with a good understanding that our God is the exousia, the greatest exousia. He is the arche. He is the pantocrator, the, the world vindicator, if you will. Now, he doesn't do it all for us. We have to come by faith and remain the house of faith. And then our battles will be won if we stand fast in him. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.